We all have a story to tell. Let's tell yours. Welcome to the Intellectual People Podcast with your host, Jason. Come together and listen to journey stories and more from interesting people. Welcome your host, Jason. Welcome to the Intellectual People Podcast. I often post on forums, and I'd like to personally thank those forum owners for allowing me to post on those forums. In no particular order, they are audiosciencereview.com, audiocircle.com, audioshark.org, audiophilestyle.com, AV Nirvana, which is also the home of Rumi Q Wizard and Audio Lens, DIYaudio.com, gears.com, and Parts Express Forum. Thank you so much and enjoy. Today I have Mitch, or better known as Mitchko, online from Accurate Sound. How are you doing today, Mitch? <laughs> Great, Jason. Thanks very much for having me on your show. Thanks for coming. So, Mitch, what is Accurate Sound? Accurate sound, well, the best way I can describe it is that the sound, and I'm talking about playback systems mostly, uh, so your home hi-fi system or your surround sound system, and what is meant by accurate sound is that the sound arriving at your ears has no frequency or time domain distortion. And I know that's uh, quite a mouthful, and most people probably wouldn't understand what that what that means, <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, you know, just to try and explain, as most people know, if, if you listen to audio, uh, let's just say in your bathroom, for example, the acoustics aren't so good uh, and a lot of reverberation, uh, or, you know, you could be in a living room that's uh, filled up with furniture and it sounds kind of dead sounding. But the reality is, is that uh, most speakers in rooms will produce uh, both frequency and time domain distortion just from the sound bouncing around in the room. And so what accurate sound does is that we take a measurement microphone and we measure uh, the sound in your room. And then we create through uh, digital signal processing or DSP as we call it, a filter that corrects the sound, both the frequency response and the time domain response in your room so that the sound arriving at your ears is a perfect reproduction of what was going on in the recording studio or from a mixing perspective or a mastering studio, for example. And the difference is quite amazing. Uh, when most people first hear it, they just can't uh, believe that this isn't just readily available everywhere. And there's some, I would say, innovations in the industry uh, with smaller speakers that can, uh, you know, like the uh, Amazon devices or Google devices that, um, you know, you press a button on the speaker, a tone generates in the room, and then it corrects the response. But, um, you know, those are $100 speakers. They're not, uh, you know, uh, high-end systems or audiophile systems, for example. So that in a nutshell, Jason, is just kind of what we mean by accurate sound. Sounds good. Let's go back to your early start. What Certainly, you haven't been measuring systems remotely around the world for all of your career, have you? <laughs> no, no, not at all. How did you start? I think the, you know, kind of going way back, some friends of mine that I used to go to high school with, for example, had started a band and they're called the Northern Pikes. And there's another band, The Pursuit of Happiness, that I worked with as well. And, you know, it was just fun. So I was uh, um, an electronics kind of guy, went to uh, electronics tech and, you know, and, and got a job in the electronics industry. But my buddies were in a band and, and uh, I always found that fascinating. I used to hang out and listen to them play and, and the like. And, you know, one day it turned out that uh, the sound guy didn't show up at the club to, to mix their sound. And they asked me because I knew I was, you know, fascinated by the whole thing. And so, and I had a reasonable understanding at the time of, you know, what that meant. But it was certainly my, you know, just like anything, kind of dived in and, and figured it out fairly quickly. And lo and behold, I kind of really liked what I was doing. And it was a lot of fun. And it, it was kind of a start of, you know, I had a choice to make. I was, you know, working a regular eight to five job and uh, at night staying out at the club, mixing sound to two, three in the morning. And, uh, you know, it, I was a young guy back then, so I could kind of take the 
take it. But, uh, you know, after a couple of weeks or a month or two of that, uh, I was kind of, you know, falling asleep, similar to like uh, in Fight Club there. <laughs> Not quite sure where I was sometimes. And, you know, so I decided to quit my regular job and uh, just went on the road with the guys and toured around, did live sound at uh, a lot of venues and locations. And when I came back, to mix at one of the local clubs, um, the local recording studio said, hey, would you be interested in coming out to the studio and seeing, you know, if you'd like to, you know, record bands and the like. And so by that time, I read a lot of material, got really involved in understanding how acoustics work, how speakers work, amplifiers and such. And uh, I said, sure, let's let's give it a try. And so that was the sort of the start of a 10 year career in the recording studio industry, mixing sound for all sorts of bands and uh, working at a variety of studios across uh, Western Canada. I had a lot of fun and then the kind of the market dropped out towards the end of the 80s there. And I, I'd also spent quite a bit of time on, you know, trying to learn how to program because at that time, the Macintosh was uh, kind of a regular thing in the studio. And, and uh, I was fascinated by how, you know, how is this working? And, you know, because I was used to working with the, you know, large mixing consoles and, you know, 700 pound tape machines and stuff like that. And it's like, well, here's a computer that can kind of, you know, record this stuff. So how does this work? So I spent a, quite a bit of time at a local uh, computer shop in their book section, looking at programming books and, and you know, got involved in Think C and, and from Semantic and uh, started uh, programming. And as it turns out, the owner of the shop, you know, noticed that I was coming in on a regular basis and trying to understand like, uh, so what are you doing? And, and I said, well, I'm kind of out of work, but I'm teaching myself programming and the like. And he says, well, why don't you come work for us? And so that was kind of the, the start of my software career, if you will. And then I had an opportunity to go back to school, took software engineering management at uh, the University of Calgary because of the specialized knowledge that I gained through that, um, I decided to do a little bit of consulting work and I started traveling the country a bit, uh, ended up in uh, Rochester, New York, working at Eastman Kodak, uh, moved on to Chicago, uh, worked at Motorola there for a while and uh, down in the States uh, in California, in Irvine, California for uh, another company that's no longer. And that was kind of my day job. And at night I was still you know, fiddling around with programming and fiddling around with, um, you know, the audio side of things. And then kind of around 2010, about 10 years ago, um, I was looking to develop my own DSP programs and software. And uh, I started doing some research in the industry. And it turned out, lo and behold, there was a couple of folks already developing some digital signal processing software specifically for audio and, and for the area that I was looking into, uh, which was, uh, you know, how do I control the output of my speakers in the room so that I can um, have a better sound in, in, in the room. And so I started playing with those programs and found it fascinating. And then I started writing a few articles on Chris Conacher's website. Uh, at the time, it was called Computer Audio File, uh, now called Audio File Style. And I found it fascinating to, you know, trying to share my experiences of, of what I was doing. And then Chris got a hold of me and said, well, would you like some write some feature articles about that? And I said, sure why not? And, you know, started evaluating uh, different uh, digital signal processing software, uh, started evaluating speakers that had some digital signal processing uh, in them, uh, like the key threes and the Dutch and Dutch eight C's, for example. And then I thought, well, you know, because I kind of understand, um, you know, having worked in so many different rooms and tried so many different digital signal processing software, that I thought I would offer it as uh, a service. And so, you know, I was still doing the day job, working at software companies. I worked at Microsoft for five years as a architect, a software development architect, and uh, Fujitsu for, uh, again, director of uh, cloud architecture. And of course, cloud being a, a big deal, but it's a far cry from uh, digital audio and digital signal processing. And so, 
you know, about a year or so ago, I decided that ah, I, I think I'll just, you know, try this. Um, I have a real passion for it. I think I could be very successful at it. And here we are a year later, you know, uh, working on uh, systems from, as you say, around the world. It's been a fascinating experience, fascinating meeting all sorts of people yeah. with all sorts of rooms and systems and, and the like. So it's been a lot of fun so far. Okay. Thank you so much for that long introduction. It was great. <laughs> uh, sorry, I tend to ramble a little bit. No, so. quite all right. I truly mean that. What was your programming focus back in the early days? What was your programming focused on? Because it probably was not focused on DSP, correct? Yeah, that's right. So it was a trick at the time. And to that was the early '90s to be able to, you know, have an encryption algorithm that allowed you to uh, unlock those fonts off of the CD and have them on on the desktop. And that was way before there was any kind of online digital distribution. And, and the like. So most of my career has been kind of at, at the uh, research and development level at these software companies, uh, okay. always working on something new. For example, at Eastman Kodak way back in man, I, uh, late 90s, I got hired for the digital imaging division at Eastman Kodak. And there we kind of developed, you know, a product called uh, Print at Kodak. And it was the first kind of online digital imaging uh, where you could take your roll of film at the time down to the local uh, Kodak shop. They would scan it, upload it. You would get a, a file to log in and you could kind of manipulate your images and, oh, you know, I, I was, and put a banner on it or whatever. And then you'd hit print at Kodak. And then with a geolocation, it would find out where the clo closest Kodak print shop was, print those out, and then uh, have them delivered to you in the mail. A pretty slick system. Um, it was kind of a global North America release first and then a global release after that. And again, we were kind of the first uh, in the market to do that. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a um, the whole Kodak story is a, it's a different story. But right. yeah, so, you know, business software. Um, when I worked at Microsoft, um, I was uh, um, sort of an architect there that were helping you know, end companies and end what we would call independent software vendors, uh, help them adopt uh, cloud technology. Um, and Windows Azure, for example, was the technology. And in at, in at 2010, again, that was the very first release of Azure at the time. And so, uh, you know, one small interesting story, a uh, local Vancouver company here, uh, was in the digital photography business and they were looking for a digital asset management system. They had literally uh, tens of thousands of photographer around the world, contract photographers that would go into hotels and, and con convention centers, take high resolution images and they were all you know used for brochures and online advertising and the like. And so we were talking about how there wasn't any really good digital management um, asset management systems on the market. And I said, well, you know, you could probably build your own using this technology uh, online. And so they were fascinated by that. And, you know, we got a proof of concept together and, you know, flash forward now 10 years, that company there, it was supposed to be an internal digital asset management system. They started a company and offered that online worldwide and, and their revenue after the first couple of years exceeded their you know digital photography business <laughs> you know so it's one of those things where um you know you see kind of rapid market changes where all of a sudden something that was not possible is now possible and that's kind of you know in the realm of digital audio that's what's kind of happened as well and one of the great things that you were able to do was to combine your passion of music along with your programming and digital side of things, correct? Yes, that's right. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, I, I play a couple of musical instruments, some uh, guitar and, and bass drums, uh, not very well, but still listen to music. I love the music production side, the creative side, and I love listening to it. And even though I, I have some genres that I uh, listen to, you know, the one of the things I really learned in the studio was the effort it took uh, for people to kind of put themselves out there and produce and, and record their own music and watching the creative process of that happening. It's a really fascinating thing. It's kind of, you know, like 
watching a painter paint, if you will. It was a lot of fun. Learned a lot. Learned how, you know, music was made, obviously. And so, you know, and the playback side is just as fascinating. Do you consider yourself an audiophile? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a, a lot of connotation around the word audiophile. Absolutely. I sometimes like to say audio enthusiast. I really appreciate good sound wherever it is and, okay. uh, and good music. Did the recording studio help you the way you listen to music today? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that in the recording studio that, you know, people should realize is that all of those sounds that you hear, the drums, bass, guitar, uh, vocals, they're typically on what's called a multi-track uh, system. So each drum, each uh, guitar, each vocal has a separate track. And so the idea is when you mix the sound is to, you know, come up with a blend that sounds good to the, to the ear. And so it really focused you in on being able to pick out the sounds in the mix to listen to, like, for example, I just want to listen to the bass. Yeah, I can solo that bass on my console, but I want to hear it in the mix. And so you can move the fader up and down, the level of the bass up and down individually relative to everything else. And you know that you know, want to find sort of, um, you know, the pocket. It needs to sit in the, in the mix a certain way. And so that really helped me um, understand kind of and really appreciate, you know, what good sound sounds like. And it, you know, there's a, it's just like everything, there's kind of a art and science component to it. Do you believe that a lot of the recorded music today is mucked up because there's so many knobs to twist and turn rather than the old style of having tape there with a couple of microphones and just recording raw, if you will? That's a great question, Jason. And, you know, I got a dozen thoughts just hit my head uh, uh, from that question. And, you know, I think that um, when the Apple Macintosh came out with GarageBand and offered that as a digital audio workstation on every computer that was sold free, that really transformed uh, the industry. And just like anything, there's pros and cons. And so, you know, now anyone can have a studio in a box. And really for, you know, uh, under a thousand dollars, you can have like as many tracks as you want and you can, it's all on digital audio. The sound quality is good right out of the gate to begin with. There isn't a bunch of noisy electronics and the like. You know, it's it's mind blowing to me because I mean, back in the day, you know, those tape recorders, 24 track tape recorder is like $600,000. Mixing consoles start there and go up. And now to have all of that, at, you know, at your fingertips on your computer is, it, it really is another one of those disruptive technologies. But at the same time, you know, it does take some skill and art. So, you know, I went to Columbia Academy of uh, Recording Arts. I ended up being a teacher there for a while uh, in the end in Vancouver. And, you know, there is an art to being able to get a good mix, a good sound, good signal to noise ratio on the microphones, no clipping, you know, all that kind of stuff. And now in the digital audio workstations, there's a lot of what we call presets. And so someone has, um, you know, made it such that you can dial in the amount of loudness, if you will, just by pressing a button on the computer. And it sounds good instantly, but it's like kind of like candy. After a while, once you have too much, it's like, whoa, that's kind of too much, right? <laughs> sure. And you would agree with me that there are still some wonderful recording engineers, mastering engineers, even for mainstream music, correct? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It, it's still, there's still some unbelievable recordings that are being made. And, and, and certainly, um, you know, if I put aside the kind of the, the pop rock kind of genre of, of on mass music, there is just some amazing recordings and it's totally facilitated by digital audio and where people can, um, you know, have what we would call purist recordings. So stereo recordings, where it's just simply a high quality pair of stereo mics going into a mic preamplifier and uh, through an interface into your computer um, and at a high bit rate uh, so that you're getting just, you know, 
crystal clear, perfect sound. And there's been some excellent, excellent recordings that have come out um, uh, over the years. They're more in the kind of the classical genre, uh, jazz and the like, uh, this uh, folk recordings. There's still some really good rock recordings that still come out uh, that haven't been, you know, crushed to death. And when I say crushed to death, I mean compressed or limited in what the so-called loudness war, which kind of was at its peak, I would say, in 1995 with that Oasis album that came out that everyone had or heard and had the wall of sound. And <laughs> that kind of changed the industry. Are you a proponent of DSD recording? I still think PCM is just fine. DSD is fine, too. I don't have a lot of material there. I know folks really enjoy it. I think it has a kind of a different sound quality to it. Um, and I think you can have equally as good recordings, whether it's DSD or PCM. And is it fair to say then, Mitch, that you can have equally good recordings as long as the engineer on both sides do their job properly? Yeah, that's right. It's pretty easy to make a bad recording. It's really hard to make a good recording. Uh, there's a lot, a lot going on, and aside from just you know gain matching and all of the kind of the mechanics of right. of getting it right, it's you know these the ears and how you process the sound and you know what you like, what you don't like, and and, and that really kind of affects the final final product. And I think it's important to say too that, and you referenced this earlier, is that the recording engineer is an artist to an extent right? Because they are recording something how they believe it should be recorded and presented. And there's a lot that can be manipulated just in the way a recording engineer records it, right? N other than the music, just the layout of the room and the microphones, and it goes on and on and on, it seems, right? Is that? Ab absolutely. It really is painting with a blank canvas, Right. It, 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 from a sound uh, design perspective, you know, the uh, and, and you'll find that uh, certain uh, producers, engineers have their own sound uh, that they like to, to, to produce. Uh, and so they get known for that. And so if I want to get the blob, Bob Clear Mountain treatment, uh, uh, then I, uh, if I like that sound, then maybe I'd, I'd like to have him kind of engineer and produce an album. Uh, or, you know, in, in most cases, what they try and capture is the sound of the band, um, their sound, and, and be as kind of as transparent as possible to try and get the best translation of, you know, what that band sounds like. I mean, a, a great example of that is like, um, you know, the, the Rolling Stones. I mean, there's no mistaking, you know, when you hear the Rolling Stones, you know it's the Rolling Stones the minute that, that they hear it, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And they've got that sound and it really hasn't changed over the, you know, the five decades that they've been playing. So let's get into actually your service that you offer, right? Which is called Accurate Sound Calibration. How does that exactly work? Give me a rundown of... Somebody contacts you and says, I have two speakers and either one to four subs probably is the most common request, I would imagine, not home theater, correct? Yes, that's correct. A lot of two channel and two channel with subs is uh, with one or more subs is, is typically the request. Okay. Um, sure. So, you know, it, it's pretty straight ahead, but it's it, it may be unusual for um some folks, uh, but basically you have to purchase a measurement microphone. You can get a pretty good microphone like the one that you're holding up uh, right now for, you know, roughly about a hundred dollars. And for the UMIC one, the mini, mini DSP UMIC one, uh, it's a, what's called a USB microphone. And so all you have to do is plug the end of that into uh, your computer and you've got a calibrated measurement microphone. And when I say calibrated, it comes with a calibration file so that the microphone with its calibration file has a perfectly flat frequency response. The idea is, is that of course, when we're measuring speakers in a room that we don't want to have any of the other, you know, either the microphone or the electronics alter the sound in any way. We want to capture what's really going on in the room. And so um, with some instructions, there's a variety of ways like REW or Room EQ Wizard is a piece of uh, excellent uh, shareware 
software, donationware software by uh, John Mulcahy that a lot of people will download and use, runs on a PC, runs on a Mac, and they'll take measurements of both the left and right channels with uh, however they have the sub set up. They send me those measurements. I extract those uh, from whatever, however they were captured, and then I enter them into uh, DSP software. The, there's several kinds of DSP software out there. I personally use a couple. One's called Accurate and the other's called Audio Lens. Those are kind of the top of the line digital signal processing software for audio. And then um, I usually have people take pictures of their system, the dimensions of their room, um, and, you know, we can get into kind of the, the technical aspects of why I would want the dimensions of the room because sound transitions from waves. If you can think of waves like um, in aquarium and you shake the aquarium and the waves go back and forth to rays uh, where, you know, if you like shine a light at a mirror and it bounces off the mirror, bounces off the side of the wall. And so... Um, once I have those measurements, uh, then I generate, uh, design a correction, des design a filter uh, for them. And, you know, because I've, uh, I know what accurate sound is, uh, there is a standard, or if you will, or there is a, you know, what's a, a, an ideal, what accurate sound means uh, with no frequency and time domain distortion basically means that I try and correct the room and the loudspeaker so that there isn't any of that that's put into a filter sent back to uh, the client and the person loads that filter into what's called a convolver i know it's a uh, some funny terms and it's basically what's called a convolution engine <laughs> and it's it processes uh the filter and the music convolves them at the same time so the output is the perfect sound for for your room and so I offer up to six filters um, because it takes a little bit of time. People have preferences. Oh, it's a little too too much bass or that's not enough treble or vice versa. And so we get into fine tuning. And then, um, you know, that's kind of the end of the process once we've kind of settled in on the that person's preference of what they like to sound. Okay. There's a lot of info there now. So <laughs> If somebody is using REW, known as Room EQ Wizard, and they take a measurement, are they measuring each main channel independently from each other, or do you not mind if they're measured together? They uh, measure each channel independently, uh, and then the DSP software is what stitches it together so that they sum correctly uh, for, with both speakers playing, if you will. Okay, and each subwoofer is also measured independently after gain matching so yes there is a, a whole pile of ways to attach subs to your system uh some people will do uh you know your typical uh, i've got my left and right output and then i'm going to split those and have those go to the subs so they still look like a left channel and a right channel uh they may just have a single sub so they've got two cables going as a mono signal to the sig uh, sub or the you know you can kind of move up the scale of audio quality by providing uh, an individual channel uh, for each uh, speaker and sub and use what's called a digital crossover um, that is again in the software that that we're talking about it's a digital signal processing digital crossover uh, and that way each speaker and sub is under complete uh, DSP control, both in the frequency and the time domain. And that's kind of the ultimate setup, um, you know, and, but you, it requires multiple channels. And, you know, for example, in, in my system, I have a, um, what's called a triamp or a three-way digital XO or uh, crossover. And uh, so I need six channels for a stereo system or six uh, digital to analog converter channels or DAC channels. Uh, but it gives you the the, the absolute best uh, control over the sound and therefore even closer to the ideal specification, if you will. Sure. And a step under that, correct me if I'm wrong, Mitch, would be something like a mini DSP, call it like a two by four balanced, if you will, right? A $130 unit. And you can run your mains with their 
main amplifiers, run them full range, use a mini DSP, which that input comes from the output of your source or preamp if you're using one. And then you have your mini DSP and that will split into your four subwoofers, for instance. Would that be the next level under what you just mentioned? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, there's several devices like the mini DSP that can that can do that. Uh, it's probably, you know, off the top of my head, there's a kind of a dozen ways to hook all this stuff up. And, and that's certainly a popular way to do it. And sometimes they'll put the crossover in the mini DSP as opposed to in the software, the digital FIR or FIR filter itself. So there's a couple of ways to where to put the crossover, uh, that kind of thing, where to put the time delays if you happen to be time aligning the drivers, which is, you know, definitely what we want to do as well. So what is the cost of your service? Uh, typically, it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, reasonable at uh, $500 US for a typical tuning service. That's assumed that you've got some DSP software that you've already purchased. There's also, uh, if you don't want to buy the DSP software, we offer it as a one-time licensing fee. Uh, you know, for example, a couple hundred dollars for either accurate or audio lens, for example. And it's kind of a software rental. Um, my DSP partners and I have worked uh, an arrangement where sometimes folks just, you know, they they want the good sound, they appreciate the good sound, but they don't want to go through the trouble of learning any software or or taking, you know, going down that route. So, so is then what they're going to do is they're going to take the Room EQ Wizard measurements, you'll plug it into Audio Lens at your house. Basically, you'll come up with the tuning. And then you'll send it back and they'll load it into the convolver, whether it's J River or Rune. Is that? Accurate? That's exactly right. Yeah, that's one hundred percent. And and uh, uh, and there's a variety of convolvers out there as well. Uh, some of them um, are you know standalone. Uh, some of them are on one platform. Or the other. Some of them are built into the music players. Um, and I'm just about to release one myself on, on the uh, Mac and uh, uh, Windows platform as well. And that will run on a Mac through what? Um, and so J River, for example, it's a VST3 uh, plugin. Um, so I offer both the plugin and the standalone application in which you can route audio from uh, an application into the convolver and out of the convolver into uh, your uh, DAC, for example. Very nice. And is there going to be a charge for your plugin? Uh, yes. Um, it's uh, going to be fairly nominal fee. I think it'll be under $100, for example. Um, nice. And it's a little bit different than most. I think, you know, there's one of the things I've run into, uh, um, you get to learn a lot in, in uh, uh, you know, over the last year, I've learned a lot about what folks want. Um, and, you know, one of the things that happens when you use a uh, fur filter or uh, put in a, uh, a filter of any sort, there's a thing called uh, filter insertion loss. And so there's, you know, the, the sound level drops down, you know, anywhere from uh, three to six to even up to 10 dB. And so, you know, the normal thing to do is just simply just crank up the volume on your volume control. That's what most people do. But people want to be able to compare, um, you know, fil filter with no filter uh, or filter A with filter B, for example. And so I built a convolver that has six filter banks in it. And uh, so that way it seamlessly transitions not only from filter to filter so you can compare, uh, but it also has a bypass feature and it's all level matched. So regardless of whether you're uh, listening to uh, with no filter or you click your filter in, um, it's all at the same level of sound pressure level so that you can actually hear the tonal differences and the sound quality differences without, without having to fiddle with um, trying to, you know, change the volume and all the rest of the headaches that are <laughs> involved with that. How long does the process take from the time somebody takes measurements with Room EQ Wizard to the time you get those measurements and they can load their file into their convolver? So there's uh, uh, typically it can be done in a day or two. Uh, and so it's pretty quick turnaround. Uh, it depends also, you know, how much backlog I've got at the time. But, you know, the actual process itself, um, 
you know, it can turn around and filter in a day or two. Uh, and then sometimes people, you know, they want to listen uh, for a period of time. Some people will listen for five minutes and go, oh, no, I, I, I want more bass or, right? And so uh, uh, we go through that iteration process. But, you know, it's the funny thing is, is that very quickly uh, people kind of zoom in on what they like and, uh, um, you know, it's, it, it, it doesn't take that long. Uh, I mean, people recognize when they hear accurate sound, they know what it, they know what it sounds like. <laughs> Do you find that a lot of people, once they take measurements, assuming they don't change their system around that, and you provide them with a file that they're pretty much set or do they constantly want to tweak things? They're pretty much set. I mean, it's, you know, um, uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, misconception uh, around, uh, uh, you know, people think, well, well, for different music genres, I should have different filters and the like. And it's like, well, it's not quite like that. What we're trying to do and accomplish is that, um, you know, trying to remove, if you will, um, any frequency and time domain distortions between you and the loudspeakers in the room. And so once that's kind of sorted out, then whatever the music that's being played, you're hearing it for what it really is. Uh, and generally speaking, like on my system, I've had my filters um, in there for over a year, which I've never, you know, um, had any need to tweak. Uh, and, and I listen to all sorts of stuff, um, you know, from old 50s uh, rock to, you know, EDM to classical and, you know, um, accurately reproduce sound uh, should sound accurate regardless of the material that you're pushing through it. What is the biggest misconception of DSP in your opinion? Well, there's a lot of controversy over whether you should correct the loudspeaker. Um, and now we're going to get into the a little bit technical here. Uh, what, what's called below the room's transition or Schroeder frequency. And this is where the room uh, transitions between at the sound acting like waves versus rays. And so in most rooms, that's roughly around between 100 and 300 hertz. And so, you know, there's no question. I think everyone, you know, even even the old diehards will, you know, once they hear clean, clear, even sounding bass, it's like, yeah, that sounds really good. And there's no other way to get it. I mean, you know, with um, you can put in bass traps in the room. But, you know, um, I used to work years ago for a company where we designed and manufactured bass traps and various other you know, passive room treatments, very much like what you have on your wall behind you, for example. Um, and, you know, you can only do so much um, when it goes down to low frequencies. When I was working at the studio, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to bounce around here a little bit. When I was working at the studio, I got a chance to work with uh, Chips Davis, who's the inventor of the live end dead end room years and years ago. And the bass traps that he used to control the low frequencies below Schroeder, um, they were the size of the room. So they had uh, the the actual room itself was a shell within a shell. And so within the, the room, he would let the low frequencies pass through the inner shell to the outer shell. They would get absorbed there so they wouldn't pass back into the room. Fascinating stuff, but, you know, they have to be physically large. And usually the ones that you typically buy from, you know, acoustic manufacturers, um, they do a pretty good job above 100 hertz, but not so much below. And so DSP is the the the, the only avenue that you that you can really control the low frequencies in your room. Are you saying though that a combination of both is really best? I just want to make it really clear for everybody listening that you're not saying to not use acoustic treatments. Yeah, I'm not saying that. Uh, and I've got acoustic treatments in my room. You can see behind me on the on the on the wall there uh, that I've got some uh, 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 you know uh, broadband absorbers, and I've got that in my room. The only purpose of those is to reduce the overall reverberation time in the room. So you know, there's a specification. I, I know it, it's often said that there is no specifications for recording sound in sound rooms and the like, but there is. And, there's, and you can find them on my website. And they've been around since um, 
you know, the the 70s and, and most control rooms, studios, etc., sort of goes with them uh, uh, or built rooms specified with those specifications. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is, is that, you know, unless your room is super lively, like it's all glass and, and the like, then you'd kind of benefit from some broadband absorption. Um, and, you know, it used to be the spec was, you know, to have a fairly dead room, but most people realize after a period of time that that sounds too closed in. Uh, and so there's kind of a happy medium. As it turns out, that happy medium is for most typical living rooms uh, that you'll find. And so, you know, like I say, if uh, part of my service is that I do a, an analysis of the acoustics in the room. And in some cases, absolutely, uh, acoustic treatment is required. Uh, the room's just simply too bright sounding and, and uh, you wanna have the, the reverb time down a little bit. But more often than not, you don't really need uh, um, uh, as much acoustic treatment as most people think. Um, and, you know, to kind of circle back a little bit on the controversy about, you know, what DSP, uh, there's a school of thought, uh, that says you shouldn't, you know, EQ the, um, in full frequency range of the, the loudspeaker, uh, just the, the low frequencies basically is what, what people are saying. And as it turns out, um, you know, if I look at my, uh, client base, uh, I would say 99% um, of them go for the full frequency correction. It just simply sounds better is, is the bottom line. Um, even with loudspeakers that are so-called um, perfectly designed, uh, like the Revel Salon 2s, for example, you know, most people say, oh, don't EQ those above uh, the Schroeder frequency. And and I have an, a number of customers or clients that have those and um, and I send them partial corrections only up to the and the full range and um you know more often than not in fact 99 percent of the time they'll they'll you know correct uh they like the full range correction uh and so that's still controversial in in, in the industry um but you know for the folks that have tried it, it it's and using you know i think part of the other issue is that um some of those comments may have been made uh, without using state, the state-of-the-art DSP software. And so with the state-of-the-art DSP software, um, uh, like I say, most people will want the full range uh, correction. And it's easy to A, B the sound and listen for yourself. And um, you know, there's really no contest. And for the people that are objective, you can measure this as well, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, um, you know, as uh, we mentioned in the intro there, um, uh, one of the things I did in uh, three or four, four years ago, I guess I wrote a book on uh, uh, digital signal processing. So um, uh, accurate sound using DSP is the title of the book. Uh, and in there, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, verifying or validating the, the the after uh, of, of the filters in place. And, and it wasn't just in one spot in the room, it's um, you know across the listening area, you get nice even sound, uh, nice even bass response, and nice even high frequency response. You know, across, for example, in my case, I've got a six foot couch that, that um, no matter where I sit on it, it sounds perfect uh, regardless. So um, absolutely. So th the measurement of the filters that are in place, I've kind of done that to death. I don't really do it anymore because it's always the same. They're within a quarter of a decibel of what the simulation says that they're going to be. I mean, this is how powerful and sophisticated the digital signal processing software that that we're using today is uh, it's incredibly powerful and that is audio lens correct made by juice hi-fi is that correct yes that's right and uh accurate by audio vero both uh yuli at uh audio vero and burnt at audio lens produce some excellent digital signal processing software um, in in my opinion, hands, uh, uh, shoulders above uh, anything else that's out there, and, and there's a huge gap. And what's the difference between those two? Uh, I think that there are some uh, operational differences. The end result is more, very similar, um, and it kind of depends on, you know, your uh, use case scenario. 
Um, audio lens is a little more automated, uh, whereas um, accurate, uh, most people would say it's kind of like an audio toolbox. And so if you're a real tinker and you know, you're know you designing loudspeakers and developing filters for those and the like, um, that's what uh, people uh, would, would probably use versus uh, audio lens, which is definitely kind of more towards the end user, even though it can be used to develop speakers as well. So it, it's kind of a, uh, um, you know, uh, one half dozen or the other, really. Okay. Would you say that speakers are still the most important part of the room or would it be the room? Um, I think that, uh, you know, below the Schroeder frequency, and this is where I think people get confused, is that the room's in control of the bass response, not your speakers. And so this is the kind of the thing for people to kind of wrap their heads around uh, that uh, you can move the speakers around in the room and you might be in between what we call room modes, um, sort of like, uh, you know, there's a you think of a sine wave like this, I'm either at the peak or the dip, or maybe I'm in between, and it sounds okay between the speakers and, and where the listening position is. Um, and so I, I, I think that above that, of course, the speakers are now in control of the sound. So in the, in the big deal there is their kind of their directivity index, if you want to be technical about it, or non-technical, kind of like their dispersion. How do they disperse in the root? Some speakers are kind of narrow dispersion. Uh, other speakers are, um, you know, wide, wide dispersion in, in the room. So if we use a constant directivity, well-designed speaker, we have a room that is acoustically treated as needed, right? And then we use DSP to control either below or full range, the Schroeder, then we top it off with multiple subwoofers. Are you a proponent of that? Yeah, I love it. That's what I've got in, in my room and other folks have. And, and uh, it, it sounds fantastic. I mean, it's just, you know, simply uh, uh, amazing. It's, it, it, it's um, you know, whether people say that, you know, the mus musicians are here or you're there, whatever the case is it's uh it's it's zen <laughs> it's it's it can be both <laughs> i agree now mitch would you agree that having multiple subwoofers because as you explained before of this if you use that sign of the peak in the valley that if you use multiple subwoofers you can mitigate most of that with multiple whereas if you have one or two you're not really going to you're going to have an effect there's no doubt. However, three or four really mitigates that peak and valley across that lower frequency range. Would that be accurate? It definitely helps, no question, without a doubt. I mean, that's, um, you know, one of your guests there, Earl Geddes, uh, with the multiple, multiple sub approach. Uh, Todd Welty from Harmon has uh, uh, some excellent white paper on, on the effects of that. Um, even though, you know, if you look closely at the Harmon white paper, they're actually still using EQ in the end. And, and that's unfortunately the reality. I mean, you know, it, it does help without a doubt mitigate uh, uh, most of the room modes, but you're still getting a variance in response. Um, and with uh, DSP, you can certainly make it much tighter uh, from a, a frequency response perspective. In addition to tightening up, you know, the time domain and, and it's kind of, that's a kind of a hard thing to help people understand because when you're listening to the, to the speakers and they're filling up the room with sound subs, for example, um, it, it, it's still activating, um, bouncing around the walls at the lower wavelengths. And so when it arrives, when the direct sound arrives at your ears, and then later you're hearing other effects, um, it, it's what makes the bass unclear. It sounds like it's nice and solid, but it's not clear yet. And so that's what the DSP does is help, you know, uh, reduce that clutter, uh, all of those reflections around the room and uh, produces that incredibly clear bass. Is there a bad DSP implemented that people can buy? 
Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, there is. I'm, I'm not going to give up uh, uh, any of the names, but uh, um, they're usually the ones that come in your AVR. Uh, not so good. Um, and in fact, most of them have uh, a number of issues. Um, usually the, um, they don't have any time domain capabilities, time domain correction capabilities. And so they're just frequency. They're just like, uh, what, what a lot of folks use as uh, parametric EQ or equalizer. Um, that's not, while it may flatten out the, the base response, it, uh, it, it doesn't help with the clarity. And I think that's where the kind of the major differentiating factor between, you know, uh, okay room EQ versus, wow, this sounds fantastic. So if someone doesn't have the state of the art budget for an accurate or audio lens and somebody wants to just get into it, what do you recommend they use for the budget DSP? So there is a, a uh, freeware program called DRC um, that is uh, a manually operated uh, digital room correction product um, that is, um, it's, it's a bit dated, but it works quite well uh, and it's free. And so, but it requires, you know, um, understanding and fiddling with uh, command line and and the like so it, but it works very well are you able and willing to help people with that if they just want to get into it and then obviously your goal would be to progress them to the state of state of the art if you will uh sometimes i do i i, I think the uh, unfortunately the issue there it's um anything that manual is very time consuming so you know if you've got um you know eight or so hours that you want to um uh, uh play with it i think that's great um i don't think you want to pay me for that uh I, it becomes very expensive relative to my service and buying um you know the top end dsp software which is also around uh five hundred dollars um, so, uh, you, you know, at an hourly rate of whatever, um, you can burn through that pretty quick. One of the things that I noticed years ago when I first started using Room EQ Wizard was it was still in development. While it worked and it worked well, worked well when it worked, it was buggy, very buggy, as most new software is. Now it is incredibly rock solid whether i use it on a windows based machine or a mac machine however audio lens and accurate while i haven't used them both i think it's important to say that they still at least the one that i have used still need that refinement if you will so they work consistently on a windows machine is that accurate I think the all three software that you mentioned are very good. Um, you have to remember that uh, these are all one man shows. And so, um, you know, and, and I've just gone through that process myself over the last eight months developing my DSP product. Uh, it's tough. I mean, I, I'm used to working with teams of software development folks. Uh, and, um, you know, you can do a lot with a team with uh, one person uh with other priorities it <laughs> it can take longer than you think and and uh and you know so the cycles longer and the testing's longer i would say all three software are um, excellent uh well developed and and uh, not not you know buggy or crashes systems i haven't run into that for quite some time uh they're they're all quite solid software they've been around for a long time i mean um, well over 10 years for all three products that you've been talking about that have, have been developed. And so they're quite stable. Um, they're, each one has their own kind of unique um, user interface and, um, and, and operation. Uh, and it takes a while to get the hang of it. Uh, and again, I mean, it, it, for the folks that... Um, you know, that have developed these things, they're, they're not necessarily, um, you know, come from the software development industry. Um, you know, once you know, we've got a couple of professors here and we've got, uh, um, you know, 
so someone that hasn't developed software you know commercially all their life right so yes. there is some uniqueness and quirkiness here and there but uh but it all works very well it's just a matter of getting it to that point and is it safe to say that if somebody purchases a full license for either program that you'll also support them in getting that up and running so you get accurate data as well yeah absolutely okay. yeah and and so i have detailed instructions on how to use all the software uh, and, you know, occasionally from time to time, I've done the, um, you know, the Zoom meetings and, and, and the like to help folks out. Um, it, it's not so much taking the measurement. That's the issue. It's getting everything hooked up is, is the issue. Um, so many drivers, uh, audio drivers, um, you know, uh, vary in quality. Uh, and so you get some of the pro sound companies like uh, Lynx or RME. I mean, their ACO drivers are rock solid, have been for a decade. Um, other companies that are kind of just coming on the market, uh, the audio drivers are not fully developed or might be bucky. And, you know, dealing with real-time audio is always a hassle. And especially if you're trying to, you know, put out a test tone and record that at the same time, there's always issues. And so we've got workarounds on, you know, hey, you can just take, rather than having uh, RUW output uh, the signal at the same time it's re re trying to record it, um, just play these files on your stereo system and then just have the mic record it. So the, the most common problem is just, you know, aside from getting the, everything hooked up and running, it's timing issues, right? There's always some, you know, one channel is delayed slightly than the other channel or, and, you know, working through all of those issues is, is, uh, uh, takes a little bit of time, but after that, it's a, it's a cakewalk. Excellent. <laughs> so would that be the most challenging part of what you're doing? Yeah, getting everything hooked up and, and working is the most challenging part. And and uh, but most people like it's amazing. Like I've had um, clients that have um, never uh, um, measured uh, their system ever before, or worked with a measurement microphone or anything like that. And and so, you know, if they're willing to take the time to try and figure it out, I've got time to help them out to get get to their goal. And uh, it usually goes pretty good, actually. I want to thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. And I also want to thank you for your writings on Audiophile Style, ASR, and the many other places that I see your writings because your articles really are fantastic and well done and very informative, which is much appreciated from myself and certainly most others because I get, do get to see all the thank yous. Oh, that's that's very nice of you. I, I, I appreciate that. I. I'm not a good writer, so those things take forever, man. I, I mean, I, I, as I, I, I look at the iterations, like how many times I've touched it, and uh, they're in the hundreds. So, wow. you know, it takes uh, it takes quite a while to. Uh, I'm 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 big on education, and trying to make it clear um, is um, it really takes time. I have it in my head what it is, uh, but putting it out through the fingertips into words. Um, I'm probably more at ease with programming language than I am with English language. So <laughs> it takes a while to make sure I've got the right meaning is coming across, especially for you know the technical topics that we're dealing with. It's uh, hard enough as it is to try and understand the terms, let alone making sure that they're coming across in the appropriate way. Absolutely. Well, once again, go visit accuratesound.ca for Canada, right? That's right. Awesome, That's right. Jason. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being on your show. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'll put the links below for the accurate sound reproduction using DSP for his book. And go visit him at accuratesound.ca as well. And of course, you can stock them out on the various audio forums and pester them there. Thank you again, Mitch. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Find us on YouTube and Facebook at the Intellectual People Podcast and online at the intellectualpeoplepodcast.com. Check back for exciting new episodes.